Are there certain words that you don't like the sound of? Are there words that when you hear them, you get kind of itchy? Just don't sound right. I had a friend of mine who was a youth minister in Virginia that every time we said the word intinction, it made his skin crawl, which is kind of funny because we did communion by intinction all the time. We're doing communion by intinction this week. Ugh. It was just something about the way the T and the N and the C kind of all work together. Intinction bothered him. And I was thinking about him this week when I was reading an article about a Mississippi State University classics professor named Robert Wolverton who surveys his students every year and asks them what they think are the most beautiful and the ugliest sounding words. Now, granted, his survey is not very scientific and deals more in the opinions of a specific set of college students in the American South, but the results are interesting and they do provide me with a jumping off point for my sermon, so here we go. He asked his students to uh, make word selections that were based on the sound of the word, not on their meaning. And so some of the prettiest words in the English language, according to his students, were eloquent, love, symphony, serendipity, lullaby. Some of the ugliest words, according to his students, were phlegm, moist, grotesque. And during my brief two-year stay here in the state of Ohio, I've noticed that people have a similar reaction when you say the M word. <laughs> now, during the week before the Buckeyes take on their Wolverine neighbors to the north, that word is apparently Michigan. But the rest of the year, I think that word is money. Now, to some, money is the most beautiful word that there is, except when someone else is asking for it. Anytime the church starts talking about money, people start getting nervous, anxious, and just a little bit nauseous. There's a good reason for that. Money is a touchy subject, especially in the church. And usually when somebody starts talking about money, we stop listening and begin waiting for them to go ahead and ask us for some. Now, I don't think most people have a problem sharing their money with people and agencies that they trust. But too many times we've seen or heard about people accepting charitable donations and then using those donations for other purposes. It's no secret that a church of this scope and size cannot last long in its current form without money. It's also no secret that some prominent ministers have used the faith of others to line their own pockets, preaching a gospel of prosperity and claiming that their fancy cars and multi-million dollar homes are a sign of God's blessings. You might remember Jim Baker of PTL fame, who was one of the first and most prominent ministers to get caught stealing from the collection plate. He was arrested in 1989 for skimming millions of dollars from the contributions viewers made to his PTL ministry and for outright defrauding many of his followers out of over $158 million. And he wasn't the last. Just recently I read about Kong Hee, who was a pastor of a megachurch in Singapore, who is currently on trial for allegedly misappropriating over $50 million in church funds to help finance his wife's pop music career. And it's not just the churches that take advantage of people's generosity and desire to help. An investigation by CNN, the Tampa Bay Times, and the Center for Investigative Reporting found that many of the charities people give millions of dollars to every year actually serve as fronts for for-profit fundraising companies and give very little to the work that they claim to support. The worst offender, according to the report, is Kids Wish Network, not to be confused with the Make-A-Wish Foundation. <clears throat> Every year, they write, Kids Wish Network raises millions of dollars in donations in the name of dying children and their families. But every year, it spends less than three cents of every dollar helping kids. Most of the rest gets diverted to enrich the charity's operators and the for-profit companies that Kids Wish hires to drum up those donations. Now, just as a side note, before you give money to a charity, do a little background research to make sure how much is actually going to the work they profess to support. There's a group called CharityWatch.org, CharityWatch.org, that can provide really good information, or you can also just call your Better Business Bureau. So, you can't really blame people for being cautious about where they put their money. Commerce seems long to have been governed by the competing dictums, a fool and his money are soon parted, 
and caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. None of us wants to be the fool parted from his money by a slick-talking salesman, so we're always on guard for a scam or a sales pitch that's a little too good to be true. Or we're just aware that when people start talking about money, it's usually because they want some. So we're not always comfortable talking about money, at least in part because of an innate sense of doubt born in our own instinct for self-preservation. We'd like to help, but we've got to make sure we have enough to take care of ourselves first. And money is a complicated word. It can sound harsh to the ears when someone is asking you for it or telling you how you should spend it. But when it comes at a time of great need, when you use it to buy groceries or pay off the mortgage, the word money can be the sweetest word on earth. One of the ways that we experience God's blessings and share those blessings with others is through money. All that we have and all that we are comes from God. And in his New Testament teachings, Jesus concerns himself with how we use our money more than any other subject. God's gifts are to be used for God's purposes, plain and simple. And that's what we see in Luke's description of the early church in our New Testament lesson this morning. Luke writes in Acts 4 that the church is a community that is of one heart and soul. They have chosen to hold everything in common and, and no one's in need of anything because if they owned lands or houses, they sold them and distributed the money to those who needed it. Now that's a ridiculously radical vision of community that I doubt very many people would embrace today. In fact, I feel reasonably sure that a fair number of Christians would label such a notion communist, which actually makes sense seeing as how the root words of community and communist are the same. Now, if it seems hard to believe that a community could all be of the same heart and soul and could actually share everything that they had, that's because it is hard to believe. And the events that occurred just a little bit later in the book of Acts suggest that if it actually did happen, it didn't last for very long. Just two chapters later, we learn that something is wrong because the widows are not being fed like they were promised to be. And then later on in Acts, we find evidence of doctrinal divisions. But what's important here is the value of the memory. Luke is writing about a time in the church's history when everyone was a part of a team and no one was out for him or herself. In the middle of this story is a line that sheds some light on this. It says, with great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. The gathered community of believers had witnessed Jesus give his life for the world. That story of sacrifice and unconditional love is what defined them as a community. Jesus had given his life for them. How then could they put more value on their money and possessions than Jesus had put on his own life? Through Jesus' resurrection, they had been reconciled to God and given a new life. How then could they respond with anything less than anything? In this passage, in chapter 4, it's actually the second time that Luke talks about this, that he highlights this aspect of the early church. He also says it back in chapter 2. And that shows that he found it important enough to repeat. Why? Because the early church was important enough to its members that it was worth sacrificing for. At the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Franklin is said to have quipped, we must all hang together, or assuredly, we'll all hang separately. That was the attitude of the early church. They'd seen Jesus give his life for it, and they could certainly do no less. But today, some 2,000 years later, no one's asking you to die for the church. No one's asking you to give everything to the church either. But we are being challenged by this memory of the early church to take serious ownership of our church. As a part of Christ's church, we receive spiritual nurture. We have a place to worship and a fellowship of like-minded believers to support us through good times and bad. We have here a home in which we can be safe to explore our faith, to ask tough questions, to learn about what it means to be a disciple, and to be comforted with the message of God's grace and mercy and steadfast love. This church is a community in which we are challenged by the gospel and comforted by it as well. And I think that's something we in the church need to be reminded of from time to time. You see, the church is not something out there that makes demands on us. 
The church is not a spiritual buffet to which we come to consume and then leave. It's an organic living thing of which we are all a part. And each of us bears a part of the responsibility for making it go. As a college student, I used to go home to do my laundry, to raid the refrigerator, to hit up my father for a little gas money from time to time. I didn't pay rent. I didn't kick in for groceries. I had the same attitude as a college student that I'd had growing up in that house. But when I got older, my attitude changed a little bit. Now when we visit my parents, we pay for a hotel room. We take my parents out to dinner and pick up the check when it's our turn. We help clean up and we contribute to paying for things so the burden of our visit is not completely on them. And that's what it's like in the church. The church is not a place we visit. The church is a family of which we are a part. As we emphasized last week, that means being generous with more than our time and our talents. But to be perfectly frank, it also means being generous with our money. All the volunteers in the world won't help if we don't have money to buy the tools they need to do their work. And all the money in the world won't help if we don't have people who can use those tools. For the church to thrive, we've got to have both. Think about a big problem like the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. Money won't heal the sick people there. But you can send all the doctors and nurses in the world, and without money to build hospitals and buy medications, those volunteers can't be effective. For Jesus, money was a means to an end and not the end itself. Money was valuable when it would met human need. Money was seen as a gift from God, meant to be used to improve life for everyone, not just the individual. And we see this sentiment in our Old Testament lesson that we read this morning, where God instructs the Israelites that if they harvest a field and find they've left something behind, don't go back for it. Those extras, well, they're to be left for those who have no fields and no real way to provide for themselves. It's the same with olive groves and grape vineyards. The fruits are to be harvested, but a second pass is not to be made. What you didn't get the first time is to be left for the poor to glean which may very well offend our sense of fair play. It's my field, you might think, and it's my crop that I planted and tended and protected from weeds and pests. The produce of that field belongs to me. Yet what Jesus teaches and what Luke's description of the early church reflects is the understanding that all that we are and all that we have come from God. God's intention is that it be shared. Now, if you've been counting, that's 29 times that I've used the word money. Make that 30. And if that's made you uncomfortable every time, I apologize. I promise it hasn't been all that easy for me to say either. But it needs to be said. And if we don't do it at any other time, then this stewardship season is a time when we have to consider our money and how we use it. My old friend Ed Robinson used to always say that there's money in this church to do all the things that God's calling us to do. We just have to take it out of our pockets and use it. If this community of faith is important to us, then we'll trust that by the guidance of God's Holy Spirit, our money will be used for the purposes of God's kingdom. And that's exactly what we'll do. So to God be all glory, honor, power, and dominion in this world and in the world that is to come.